Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. The text that engages us this morning is the Gospel reading from Matthew chapter 9. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our Rock, our Redeemer. Amen. This morning we are remembering and giving thanks for the evangelist and apostle St. Matthew who will be guiding us in the coming months of the new church year through the story of Jesus, his birth, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his coming again. Now, Matthew was called to bear witness to this story, sent to share it with the world through word of mouth as he shared with others all that he had seen and heard from the Christ. Even more to be the one through whom the Spirit would preserve this story by guiding Matthew's pen. That you and I would have the treasure of this gospel to read, mark, and inwardly digest as we see this Jesus who has come also for us. Now the text chosen for this occasion is the day that it all began. The day Jesus approached Matthew as he was in the middle of the grind of his work day. There at the tax collection booth. Jesus looked at Matthew and saw something the rest of the world could not possibly see. Matthew writes, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. Now if anyone could have provided the in-depth perspective of this story, this moment, it was Matthew. I mean, he could have given us the backstory of the events that led up to him choosing the vocation of tax collector or, or how that calling had chosen him. He could have given us a glimpse of his heart, his thoughts, emotions, as this rabbi named Jesus locks eyes with him and invites him to do something more. And yet, we get one verse. Jesus acting, Matthew responding. The one place in Matthew's Gospel where he could have shifted the focus to himself, Matthew refuses. The only story that truly matters is the one where Jesus is at the center. But before we can dive into the rest of the text this morning, we need to have a quick biology lesson on how the human eye works. So what is needed for our eyes to see anything? Light, right? In what direction does the light travel in relation with respect to our eyes? travels into our eyes, that our eyes have these photoreceptors that convert the light rays into electrical impulses that then travel to the brain using the optic nerve. All right, we know that we've studied that's how the human eye works, but Jesus, a few chapters earlier in Matthew chapter 6, offers another lesson on how the eye works. He writes, or he says, The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. So Jesus invites us to look at another understanding of how the eye works. That he refers to the eyes as the lamp of the body. Not the lamp for the body. 
In other words, Jesus teaches that the eyes allow light to come out of the body. And through a person's eyes, you can see whether there is light or darkness within that person. And this is quite the opposite of what you and I and every other person in the world has come to know about how the human eye works. There's an important truth here for us to realize, especially if we're going to understand what is going on with the Pharisees in our reading this morning. And it's this. Where you look and what you see when you look there reveals much about what is inside of you. I'll say that one more time. Where you look and what you see when you look there reveals much about what is inside of you. With this principle in mind, let us continue with our gospel reading this morning, starting at verse 10. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So what do the Pharisees see? They see a fellow rabbi doing unthinkable things. I mean, first they watch Jesus approach a tax collector's booth to recruit a disciple. Never mind the fact that Jesus was going after students rather than waiting them for a, to line up around the corner, hoping that he would allow them into his rabbinic school. And again, never mind the fact that Jesus was willing to be in the same social scene as these colorful characters of ill repute. But Jesus was doing the unthinkable. He was engaging in table fellowship with them. With every chew, the Pharisees were essentially hearing Jesus say, I'm okay with everyone at this table. There is no place that I would rather be than with sinners. I mean, you can imagine the Pharisees' behavior upon watching all of this unfold. I mean, the pointing, the whispering, the head shaking in disapproval. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. Now, to the Pharisees' credit, they were seeing what they were trained to see. These guys knew the scriptures better than anyone, having most, if not all, of the Old Testament memorized. They were legitimately attempting to live faithfully to God. And yes, even the Pharisees knew that from time to time that they too failed to keep the law perfectly. But the truth remains. Where you look and what you see when you look there reveals much about what is inside of you. The Pharisees looked at these sinners and these tax collectors and they saw people who didn't measure up to the standards of the law. They saw people who disgusted them, repulsed them. They saw people that made them cringe every time they encountered them on the street. They saw people who made them roll their eyes, people who made them pray aloud, thank you God that I am not like those people. Pharisees saw people who were other, people who were not like them, and it revealed much about the darkness inside of them. Now, having seen all of this, the Pharisees turn to Jesus' disciples and they ask, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And of course, Jesus overhears the question, and he responds in such a way that gives the Pharisees another way of looking at the world. To a question about eating, Jesus gives an answer about healing. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, of whom there are none, by the way, 
but sinners. Now, I want you to imagine someone who you are tempted to despise. Someone who makes you cringe or recoil. Someone you have completely written off. Someone who angers or frustrates you without saying a word. Someone on whom you shine the lamp of your eyes and think to yourself, thank God I'm not like that person. Maybe it's someone who made the headlines this week for an unthinkable crime. You saw their face on the news or in the newspaper. Maybe it's someone you encountered on the streets, in a park. Maybe it's someone at work, someone in your family, someone at this church. Now imagine that person, all of those people, sitting around a table, having dinner with Jesus. Or imagine Jesus walking up to one of them and saying, come, follow me. Where you look and what you see when you look there reveals much about what is inside of you. As it turns out, you and I need to hear Jesus' call to discipleship there in verse 13 just as much as the Pharisees. Jesus says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. The Pharisees, of course, would have known that Jesus was quoting the prophet Hosea. They had most likely studied this passage in depth. They were the experts, the people that you would consult if people wanted to know what this verse meant. And then Jesus invites the experts to go and learn. Go and do what disciples do. Go back to the Word of God that you think you know and allow it to shine its light on what you have failed to see. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. When Jesus looks at people, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, he desires mercy for them. Even people who reject his mercy, even those who oppose him, even those they, that called him a traitor and convicted him of an unthinkable crime, nailed him to a cross, even when they tried to explain the empty tomb with lies about how they had hidden the body, Jesus desired mercy for them. And this is why Jesus goes to Matthew in the midst of this questionable trade and calls him to be a disciple. This is why Jesus reclines at table with those he knows have sinned. He knows don't deserve his mercy. And yet he desires mercy even for them. Even you. God looks at you. He sees everything. Without even looking at your eyes, He knows your heart. And given everything that He finds there, He would have every reason never to look at you ever again. And yet God continues to look at you. And what does he see? He sees the child to whom he has made a promise. A child he dearly loves. A child who was struggling to make sense of everything that your eyes are seeing in this broken world as you gaze upon its cracks, its crevices, and all the things that you know aren't right, the things that make you uncomfortable, and you're trying to make sense of it all and what to do with it. And he graciously gives you another place to look. He gives you the cross. He places himself right in the middle of your story. 
and he shows you what he is up to. That all of your sin, all of the brokenness in this world has come to an end. It is finished. That the day is coming when all things will be made new again. And as you live in it, as you struggle with it, as you wonder what to do with all of this mess, as you are uncomfortable with the people you encounter and wonder where justice is, he gives you a, the cross, his son hanging there for you. For who are you other than one to whom God has shown mercy and with whom mercy is having its way? And who am I other than one to whom God has shown mercy and with whom mercy is having its way? And what is mercy? I think it's like light. Light that can fill the whole body, every nook and cranny where darkness hides. Light that can make our eyes shine with incredible beauty. So that when we look at those who we have seen as other, there is no them. There is only mercy. There are only those who are sick and in need of healing, who are in need of Jesus and the mercy that he has to, for them, that he offers to them through you. Those that need the light with which you have been filled. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.